going to move on to our final topic, and that's membrane separations. So, during today's lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to what membranes are and how membranes work. And then we'll get, have a look at some of the different membrane materials that we can actually use for our membrane separations. And then I'm going to start by sort of having a look at transport of material through porous membranes. And that's one of the types of membranes that you'll see will come across in the next two lectures. <coughs> So we remember what we have is a semi-permeable barrier. And through our semi-permeable barrier, we actually put in our feed. So part of our feed actually passes through our membrane and comes out as what we call the permeate, and some of our feed material doesn't pass through our membrane, and that comes out of our membrane section as a material called the retentate. So the separation we're actually doing is we're taking our feed and we're separating that into a permeate and a retentate. Okay, material that passes through the membrane and material that doesn't pass through the membrane. Also, to help us with our separations, we can have an optional sweep gas in our permeate section. And what that does is help push the material out that's passed through our membrane to reduce the concentration that's passed through our membrane. So with membrane separations, we're generally looking at streams that are liquids or gases, so fluid streams. Okay. So under this part of membranes, we're not really thinking about filtration, which is actually generally a solid material that actually doesn't even pass through our semi barrier, just sits on the surface. In this case, we're mainly thinking of fluids, and they pass through the membrane. <clears throat> the only exception really is in some bioprocesses, we might have some kind of solid in the system, so they might actually be cells and some may pass through the membrane, and some may not pass through the membrane. So our barrier, our membrane barrier, <clears throat> is often a thin, non-porous polymeric film. Okay, so that's a, a film that's made out of polymers and it's generally non-porous. So the materials have to actually absorb onto the membrane surface. However, we can have a variety of different materials. So instead of non-porous polymers, we might have porous polymers. So this is a polymer structure that actually has spores pores or holes through which material can pass through those pores. We might have a ceramic material. So this is an example of a ceramic membrane. So we've got our tubes which our feed passes through and then the material that passes through the membrane passes through this ceramic material you can see here in the cutaway where it's been broken to reveal the tubes. We can also have membranes made out of metals. So again, that's a very non-porous structure. And we could also have what we call gel, so like a gel membrane. So that's almost a liquid membrane where we actually allow our materials to diffuse through our gel. So our membrane separations are slightly different to some of the other separations we've actually looked at. So in liquid-liquid extraction, we're specifically separating on materials that are immixable. So our immiscible liquids, we're separating on that. Whereas 
with our membranes, our permeates and our retentates tend to be miscible with each other. So if we wanted to, we could mix them back. So that's a difference to some of the other separation techniques we've been looking at so far. <clears throat> also, actually having a semi-permeable barrier is needed for our membrane separation, okay? It's, well, it's in the name, isn't it? Membrane. So we have to have our, our membrane barrier to allow the separation. <clears throat> I suppose the biggest difference is a sharp separation is often very difficult to achieve. So because we have our, our membrane, the way the separation works, we have our feed that passes onto our membrane, and generally, all of the materials in the feed can actually pass through the membrane. Okay? The separation occurs because the different materials in our feed pass through the membrane at different rates. Okay? So we can specify, say, the, the recovery or the separation of one of our components, but then our other components just pass through our membrane in amounts relative to the rate that they actually diffuse through the membrane. So it's very difficult to achieve that sharp separation between our components. So membranes have quite a lot of advantages. So for something like uh, azo azotropes, when we looked at azotropic distillation, we found a lot of the methods we actually needed. We needed to add some kind of solvent or mass separating agent. So we don't need to do that with a membrane. We can just allow the material to pass through and we can even separate materials that have azotropes through our membrane. So generally we don't need for any separating of any other components, any recycling or any storage of materials. So we just have our membrane to pass our material through. We don't need to recycle any components back round. You know, we don't have a mass separated agent. We don't need to store materials because we can operate the membrane as a continuous, as a continuous process. Membranes can potentially save a lot of energy uh, and a lot of operating costs. So with our membrane we generally just have a high pressure feed, which we may have anyway. We place that for our membrane. So from that distillation, where distillation we've got reboilers and condensers, we're putting lots of energy and operating costs into our system. With membranes we don't have that. We just have to flow the material through our membranes. So I put here that it's a relatively simple technique. I suppose <coughs> that depends on your definition of relative. Um, <coughs> but the principle behind it is the material passing through the membrane. And some material pass through the membrane much faster than others. Okay, So that's how the separation works. That's the principle behind the membrane separations. Membranes are also quite compact, so they don't take up a lot of room in your plant. So here's an example, actually, of a membrane separation system. So that's an industrial scale membrane system. And you can see sort of how much smaller something like that is compared to, say, your you know, 100 meter tall insulation column that's potentially 10 meters in diameter. You know, you've got that to maintain, or you've got something like that. Uh, in a small corner <coughs> and, um, and of course they're relatively lightweight and of course that comes in from the amount of size they are they're much smaller so they're much less so they're potentially a, a good unit to put if you've got a limited space or you've got an inside plant your plants inside and you don't need to worry too much about structural support for the building you've got in the equipment in. However, there's really two main disadvantages of membranes. 
and these real disadvantages are probably the reason why membranes aren't used more than their use in industry isn't as widespread as it could be for the quality of the technique. And that first one is the high cost. So steel membranes tend to be very expensive. And the other issue is, is if you want to double your flow through a membrane, you essentially need to double the surface area of your membrane. So you basically need to double the amount of membrane you have. So there's not really any economy of scale because you have to work in these modular units and you just have to buy a whole other membrane. Okay? And still membranes tend to have a short lifespan, so they can get clogged, they can get damaged by any flows, uh, especially if you do have any solids in your material, those solids might get trapped in the pores and they might damage the membrane, clog the membrane units. So those two reasons really are why membranes aren't as popular as they potentially should be in industry. <clears throat> However, there's a lot of work looking at uh, actually developing membranes for industrial use. Um, so that would be new fabrication methods, uh, new materials. So currently there's, there's research actually at Manchester looking at uh, adding graphene to membrane materials. So the graphene has strength to that membrane material to allow it to be more resilient and not have to be changed as often. So membranes have a wide variety of different applications and the name of sort of the separation depends upon the size of the material that we're actually trying to separate. So if we start with quite a large material, um, so things like sand, basically are your filtration, so you previously looked at filtration last year, and that's a process where the solid particles actually get stopped by that filter on that membrane surface and they don't pass through. Okay? <clears throat> As we start to go smaller in size, we might be looking at things like bacteria uh, and how we so we're thinking of water treatment applications. And those those parts fall into what's called micro and ultra filtration. Okay, so we're, we're talking much smaller materials, sort of one micrometer, 0.1 micrometer for these. Okay. <clears throat> then as we get even smaller, we've got things like dissolved organic materials, uh, potentially viruses, so that would be industrial separations, uh, maybe separating water from organic materials. Uh, and that's down at sort of very small scales, even quite small molecules, thousands of Daltons in molecular weight. And that process is generally more towards the nanofiltration end. And then as we get very small, perhaps dissolved salts, we can think of reverse osmosis as our separation. And then right at the bottom end, we've got gas permeation, which is essentially looking at the separation of gas molecules from each other. So if you remember, right at the very start of the course, one of the separations you had to think about was the separation, I think it was of nitrogen and hydrogen from each other, uh, and whether that was possible by distillation. And I think the, the consensus was it wasn't, but potentially gas permeation is one of the, the different separations we can do. Okay. So there's some more information about some of those different separations in the handbook, so I'll let you read that. Uh, but then some of the examples as we move into the tutorial questions will cover some of these different classifications. <coughs> So with membrane separations, there's some key terms that we basically need to know 
to help us design and think about our membranes. So the permeability is a measure of how easy it is for a material to pass through a membrane. So it's related to the membrane material, the membrane size, the membrane thickness, and also the material, and also the species you're trying to pass through the membrane. So it's a very difficult measure to try and predict. It tends to vary with things like temperature. So often it's a measure that's obtained from experiments and then that's stored for and then that's stored for a particular membrane type and we can look that up to use it. A measure that's more useful is potentially the permeance. So that's the permeability of our membrane per unit thickness of our membrane. And that's essentially the flow rate of the species passing through the membrane per unit area of the membrane and per unit driving force. So the driving force depends if it's a liquid or a gas use of the membrane. So if it's a liquid use, the driving force is generally the difference in concentration of the species on the permeate side and the retentate side of the liquid. <coughs> and for a gas, it's generally the partial pressure difference between the two sides of the membrane. So it's possible for a membrane to have a very low permeability, so a membrane that's quite difficult for materials to pass through, but it could have quite a high permeance because the membranes can be very thin, maybe in the nanometers of thickness of membrane. Okay? So the flux from membrane is the flow rate of the material that's passing through the membrane per unit area of the membrane. So it's the essentially our permeance times by our driving force. Okay? And that driving force is either the concentration difference or the pressure difference across the membrane. So the selectivity is essentially the ratio of the permeabilities <coughs> of our materials passing through the membrane. So, in this case, if we've got two materials, I and J, it's the ratio of the, the, per the permeability of material I, so that would be the species that passes through the membrane the fastest, divided by that of J, which would be the species that passes through our membrane more slowly. And as well as calling that the selectivity, that's often also called the ideal separation factor. Okay. And that's essentially defined as the best possible selectivity that we can have for our membrane. And the final important parameter is the cut, and that's the fraction of the feed that's actually passing through the membrane compared to the total amount of feed. So that's essentially the flow rate of the permanent. Um, the permeate for our membrane divided by the flow rate of our feed. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So I quickly mentioned a few different membrane materials. So one of the most popular is synthetic polymers. So we can pick our polymer and polymerize our material into our membrane. But synthetic polymers are, if you think about it, it's essentially a plastic bag. Okay, that's, at the end of the day, it's a slightly sophisticated plastic bag. So it's got quite a restrictive operation window. So generally, the operating temperature 
needs to be less than about 100 degrees C. Because if we go much hotter than this, what happens is essentially our membrane just melts. But we can also use either glassy or crystalline polymers. So if we want a more ordered membrane structure, we can, we can have a more crystalline polymer that gives us a more defined uh, pore size or dense packing for our membrane. So it's just an example there of essentially a uh, zoomed in version of a, a polymer membrane. So you can see the polymers and then you can see the small pores passing through our membrane and that's the pores that our materials pass through. <coughs> So we can also have ceramic membranes. So ceramic membranes are no normally microporous. So we'll come on to the difference between things with micropores and dense membranes later on. But one of their big advantages is that they can withstand higher temperatures. So if you've got a hot stream, you can think about looking at using a ceramic membrane get your separation. And they can also tolerate sort of reactive or corrosive chemical species passing through them. So your ceramic membranes are essentially more hard wearing than your polymer membranes. And also, as I mentioned earlier, you can have metal membranes, so potentially uh, palladium which is actually used for separating uh, things like hydrogen and, and helium. So that's that gas permeation. And, me and metals are dense membranes. So, like, so microporous membranes like ceramics, <coughs> They essentially contain small interconnected pores. Okay. So these pores are up to about 20 micrometers in diameter. And these porous membranes tend to be used in operations like microfiltration, ultrafiltration, and nanofiltration. So that's that's how things like uh, bacteria separation, algae separation, uh, types of materials around that size. Potentially separating organic liquids from, from aqueous systems. The, because they're porous, the way that they work is the diffusion of the larger molecule is essentially hindered by its size. So as the molecule tries to pass through the pore, Essentially, it bounces up the sides of the pore and is hindered by having to pass through that small gap. And that's what slows down the larger materials. We can also generate our microporous membranes to actually work by what's called sieving. So that's more thinking about filtration, where we actually design the pore to be smaller than our larger species, so our larger species can't be put through our membrane at all. Okay? And that's obviously a very effective separation because the species that has a larger molecule can't pass through the membrane at all. Okay? So dense membranes are, tend to be dense solids. So dense membranes don't have pores. So the material can't actually pass through the pores. What happens instead, we have a different mechanism. Our components actually dissolve or absorb onto the membrane surface. And then the materials actually diffuse through the solid membrane and then they desorb on the other side of the membrane. So we've got a slightly different mechanism for the way that that transport through the membranes happens for our dense membranes. And the diffusion through our solid membranes, our dense membranes, is several orders of magnitude smaller than if we're trying to pass material through pores. Okay? So although 
we can separate spoiled material and potentially get a better separation with our dense membranes. The disadvantage is that the diffusion is a lot slower. Therefore, we either need more membrane area, so we need bigger membranes, or we have to cope with having much smaller flow rates trying to pass our membrane modules. So a compromise system for our membrane would be an asymmetric membrane. So this is actually a, a composite membrane of the microporous and the dense membranes. So what we have essentially is a, a layer of microporous membrane next to a layer of a dense membrane and the material has to pass through both of these membranes in series. So the dense layer is typically very thin. They are 100 nanometers to 10 micrometers. And it gives us that advantage of having a dense layer, which is highly selective, but, but to counteract the low permeability of our dense layer, we have our microporous layer. So our microporous layer adds some strength to our membrane to our membrane. Uh, and generally, we have comparatively larger thicknesses around 100 micrometers, but our microporous layer has our low selectivity. So our microporous layer allows the diffusion through the membrane to occur faster, and our dense layer allows us to retain that high selectivity. Okay, does that make sense? <coughs> so I'm going to move on to look at some of the different transport mechanisms through our different types of membrane. So the first type of transport mechanism we have is full convective flow. So if we've got very large pores in our membrane, so the pores are much larger than the size of our molecules, what happens is we just get bulk flow through our large pores. So you can see here, this pore size is much larger than even the largest one of our our molecules that we're trying to separate. So we just get a bulk flow through our pore. And the problem with that is, is because we just have a bulk flow, everything essentially moves through our pore at the same rate. So we don't get any separation. So if we have pores that are too large, our membrane essentially doesn't have any function, it doesn't, have any, it doesn't do any separation. So we need to make sure that we design the pore size correctly for the relevant separation. So if we were to do this and start to reduce the size of our pore, what we have is what's called permaselective diffusion. So because you can see now that the pore size is actually around the same size as the molecules that we're trying to pass through it, we don't get bulk flow. What we actually get is some form of hindered flow with some interactions between the, between the molecules and the pore. Therefore, we get different flow rates of each of our components through the pore. And because we have that difference in flow rate through the pore, we get separation. So if we were to actually make the, the pore even smaller, so in fact the pore is now so small that our larger molecule can't actually pass through that pore. So what we actually get is we end up with having an enhanced separation. 
because some of our molecules won't even fit for our form. So we have that similar effect that I mentioned, where we get good separation because, say, this larger molecule here can't even pass through, so we only get one of our species passing through our membrane. So it's a highly desirable case if we can design a membrane to do this. It's great because we get that great separation factor, great separation. But it's very difficult to do, especially if we're trying to separate materials that are half molecules with very similar size. So in that case where I was saying about the hydrogen and helium separation, both molecules are very similar size and they're also both very small. So trying to design a pore that allows one of those molecules to pass through is almost impossible to do. So if we have these very small pores for gases, we have a special case in that what we can have is the mean free path of the, of the gas molecule is actually greater than the, than the pore diameter. So if this is the case, what we get is a special case of diffusion called Kuznetsov diffusion. And that means that we can actually get separation of our gas molecules and that separation is dependent on the molecular weight of our gas molecules. So later on in the lecture, what I'll do is I'll, show, I'll go through some of the equations for an example of gas diffusion through our porous membranes. <clears throat> but first, let's go through the example of liquid diffusion through our porous membrane. So what we can do is make some assumptions about our process. So in this case, what we're doing is for our general membrane system, we have a liquid feed, and that liquid feed is passing through our membrane, and on our permeate side of the membrane, we have a sweet liquid okay, that helps remove our liquid that passes through the membrane. What we've got on either side of our membrane is identical total pressures, but different, different concentrations of each component. So it's that difference in concentration that's driving that separation through the membrane. But because we've got total uh, the same total pressure, we're not getting that full flow through our membrane. And our species diffuse through our membrane at different rates because we've selected a, a good size for our membrane, our membrane pore, so we don't, again, don't have that bulk flow. So if we zoom into our membrane surface, we have our liquid on our feed side, and a liquid on our permeate side, with our porous membrane in the middle. What we have on our feed side is we have a much higher concentration. And then as this passes through the membrane, we get some of the permeate. So we get a lower concentration of that same species on our permeate side. And it's that difference in concentration that actually drives the flow rate through this porous membrane. <coughs> so the flux of our material passing through our membrane is essentially given by modified version of Flick's law. So hopefully you remember Flick's law from that here. Yes. Um, but essentially it's the, the flux is given by essentially a constant that's related to the diffusivity of the material passing through the membrane times by driving force, which is the difference 
of concentration on each side of the membrane. So that equation for Flick's law there gives us the flux just through the membrane. <coughs> okay, so we've got the concentration on the membrane surface on the feed side and the concentration on the membrane surface on the permeate side. Okay? So hopefully from something like a catalytic reaction engineering, you'll remember that there's a small change in concentration as we pass through the boundary layer from our bulk to our membrane surface. But what we can do is we can actually assume that this mass transfer resistance through our boundary layer and our surface is actually negligible in comparison to the resistance we've actually got passing through our porous membrane. So what we can do is expand our modified flux law to say that the flux is now our effective diffusivity over the thickness of the membrane times by our driving force, where we've taken our driving force to essentially be the concentration in the bulk feed to the concentration on the bulk permeate side. And if we think back to our definition of the flux that we did earlier, where we said that the flux was given by the permeability over the thickness of the membrane times by our driving force, we can see that the effective, in this case, the effective diffusivity, the effective diffusivity is essentially our per permeal, um, per permeativity. I can say the word. <laughs> So what that leads us to do now is think about well, the effect of the diffusivity of our material through our membrane. So it's not a simple system because we've got all these micropores in our membrane and our membrane isn't all pores. There's some of the polymer and obviously our material is not passing through our polymer. And also our pores aren't necessarily straight so they might bend through our surface, so the length of the pores might not be exactly the same as the thickness of our membrane. So what we can do is we can define the effective diffusivity in terms of a few other key parameters that we do know for our membrane surface. So we can say that our effective diffusivity is essentially equal to the volume fraction of the pores in the membrane, so the amount of our membrane is pores, times by the molecular diffusivity coefficient for our material actually passing through the solution it's in, divided by the tortuosity of the pores. So that basically how, how bent and how good the pores are. So I think some of these terms you, you should know from uh, catalytic reaction engineering for transport through pores. And then <clears throat> times by a restricted factor, and that restricted factor accounts for any interference or collisions we have between the walls of the pore and our molecules. But what we can do is essentially represent that restrictive factor as 1 minus the diameter of our molecule divided by the diameter of our pore. Okay? And we can use this when obviously our molecule is smaller than our pore. If our molecule is bigger than our pore, it won't fit through our pore at all. Okay? 
So because we saw that our selectivity ratio is essentially the ratios of our permeabilities, if we plug our definition of the effective diffusivity actually into that ratio, because the volume fraction of the pores and the torch velocity of the pores are the same for both of our materials, because it's the same membrane, they cancel out. And that basically gives us a ratio for the, for the selectivity of essentially the, the, the diffusion constant for our material I times that by that restricted factor divided by that same for four hours of component J. Okay, so if we know the restrictive factor, which we can calculate by knowledge of the size of the molecule and the size of the pores, and if we know the diffusion constant, which we can find because there's information of the diffusion constants of chemicals moving through different liquids, if we know those, we can then find straight away our selectivity ratio for that membrane. This is the liquid diffusion and the fact that the separation is essentially the ratio of the diffusivity is times the restrictive factor. So now I'm just going to move on to look at if we're trying to separate gas through our microporous membrane. So essentially we're following the same assumptions as for the liquid. So <coughs> we've still got identical total pressures. We've still got no bulk flow for our membrane. But of course the big difference is, is that we've now got a gas feed to a sweet gas. And our driving force is now the partial pressures of the components rather than the concentrations of the components. So again, just like the liquid, we can represent our, our membrane with the feed side, permeate side, and we've got our partial pressure on the feed side at the surface of the membrane, and the partial pressure at the surface of the membrane on the permeate side. So we can represent again our flux through our membrane by Flick's law. So in this case we've got the effective fusivity over the thickness of the membrane. But this time we've got a term in for the gas, so the concentration over the total pressure. And then our partial pressure driving force. But if we assume we can approximate the gas to an ideal gas law, we can replace this total concentration and the pressure by the gas constant times the temperature. So you can see in this case, the flux is directly compared to the temperature that we're actually carrying out our membrane separation. So exactly like we did for the liquid boundaries, we can say that any mass transfer through that boundary layer is negligible. So we can take our Flint's law and modify the partial pressure difference to now be the partial pressure of our material in the pool feed to the partial pressure of the material in the pool permeate. Now, the difference for the gas mainly comes in for what's our effective diffusivity. So with the gas, what we have is, is first of all, we have the gas that can move through our pores via our ordinary diffusion exactly like for a liquid. But as well as that mechanism, we can actually have 
the gas move through the pores by that Hudson diffusion that I mentioned before. And that occurs more when the pore diameter is very small and is similar to the mean free path length of our gas molecule. So what we actually have is our effective diffusivity is still our ratio of the, the volume fraction of pores over the tortuosity of the pores. <coughs> but now instead of that just being times by the, the diffusion constant, we now have the sum of the regular diffusion constant and our Crudson diffusion. Okay? So we know our regular diffusion, because we can just look that up. But for our Hudson diffusion, we need to go back and think about kinetic theory of gases. So you should have covered this in uh, probably this chem in first year. Uh, if any of you can remember that back that far. But uh, what we can do is we can write down, first of all, that a Knudsen diffusion coefficient is essentially represented as the diameter of our pore times by the average velocity of our particle, <coughs> our molecule, divided by three. Well, our average velocity of the molecules for, a, for an ideal gas is essentially given in terms of the temperature and the molecular weight of our gas. Okay? So what we can do is substitute this expression for the average velocity into our expression for the Hudson diffusion and get this lower equation here <coughs> where we can say that our Hudson diffusion is basically a constant which is made up of things like pi, the ideal gas and the three times by the diameter of the molecule sorry, the diameter of the pore sorry, the temperature and the molecular weight of the gas. So if we go back to our expression for the flux, we can also substitute our effective diffusivity parameter into this expression for the flux. And if we compare this for our definition of the flux, we can see that we can actually write an expression just for the permittivity of the membrane, where again we have that combined version of the diffusivities. Now, what we can do if we have quite small pores, and for a lot of the cases, Gas, in gas separation through membranes, <coughs> the diffusion due to the Hudson diffusion actually dominates the, the method of flow for our pores. So we can just ignore our regular diffusion through those pores. So if we substitute the expression in, for our Nudson diffusion coefficient into this expression, we can get that the permittivity is equal to our Nudson diffusion constant, and again the volume fraction of the pores, the tortuosity of the pores, the diameter of the pores and then this ratio of our temperature to our molecular weight. <coughs> 
so if we take our selectivity again, which is our ratio of the permittivity is of our two components, we can basically divide this equation by each of, the, each of our components A and B. And of course, as exactly with the liquids, the, the size of the pores stay the same because it's the same membrane, the temperature stays the same, the tortuosity, the, the, uh, the volume fraction of the pores all stay the same because it's the same membrane. And the only thing we're left with is the molecular weight of our two species we're trying to separate. So the separation factor is therefore just related to the ratio of the molecular weights of the two species that we're trying to separate. So that's for gas separation. Okay? So I mentioned earlier that if we have dense membrane mm -hmm. or a non-porous membrane, that we have a slightly different mechanism. So we don't have material passing through the pores, we have to have absorption onto the surface of the membrane, fusion through the membrane, and then absorption off the membrane. But because this is a dense membrane without pores, the diffusion is a lot slower than when we have a porous material or when we've got material just moving through in bulk flow. So <clears throat> I've just put a couple of examples here. So you know, this is cell diffusion of hydrogen, 1.6 centimeters per second, centimeter squared per second. We've got carbon dioxide. So we've got, you know, we're of the order of you know, 1 to 0 0.1 centimeters squared per second for a gas in a gas. So if we've got liquids in liquids, we've already dropped there about five orders of magnitude for our diffusion coefficient. So this would be like separating liquids through porous membranes. Around the same order of magnitude would be gases separated by Hudson diffusion. And there's two examples there, hydrogen and carbon dioxide. We see carbon dioxide has a higher molecular weight, so the diffusion coefficient is slightly lower than that of hydrogen. And then at the bottom, we've got two examples there of dense or non-porous membrane materials. So look how much lower the diffusion coefficient is for materials passing through that dense membrane. You know, it's, all, it's, it's four to five orders of magnitude lower than materials passing through our porous membranes. Okay? So that's why we try and look at these asymmetric membranes to give us a rigidity, rigidity by using the porous membranes, but using the good separation from the dense membranes. So as I said, basically, we're looking for the species to absorb onto the dense membrane, then they diffuse through the dense membrane, and then they dissolve off the dense membrane. <coughs> and we can look at using the solution diffusion model to actually design that, that permeability through our membrane. And then we still use flux law. Flip, we still use flux law for the actual transport through our dense membrane. But remember, we've got a much lower uh, diffusivity. So next week, I'm going to go on and going to have a look at developing that model for the diffusion through the dense membranes. And then when we've done that. I'm going to show you how to actually design a membrane unit for the simplified, fully mixed flow membrane. <laughs>